from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a Q&A with Justin Coughlin, the artist for this evening. I am uh, John Hansen. I'm head of the music section at the National Library Service, and the duties of our section are to, in short, provide music scores in particular, and especially Braille, to those who need them. And um, there is, of course, much more to say than that. But uh, to get uh, things moving along, uh, I would like to uh, pass the first question, and you, the mic will be open to everyone in just a minute, to Karen Kenninger, the uh, director of the National Library Service for the Blind. Well, thank you, John. It is a pleasure to have Justin here tonight. And as you know, we are talking about Braille music. So Justin, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about your, your experience with Braille music and how it has fit into your career, which is really rocketed up in the last uh -huh. number of years. Can you tell us about your experience with Braille music? Absolutely. Well, uh, just to, to backtrack a little bit before that, um, my, my music training started on the violin, and it was with the Suzuki method. And uh, when I was younger, I was low vision. So Braille music really wasn't in the periphery, but uh, I would learn by ear. And um, then I started taking piano lessons when I was nine. And uh, to be completely honest, I wasn't really a fan of either. <laughs> Music was there, and it was something that I did as a kid, but I would much rather be playing video games or basketball. Uh, what did happen, though, is when I turned 11, I, that's when I lost my vision completely. And uh, things changed uh, quite drastically for me. The things that I really enjoyed doing sort of vanished. And uh, I had a lot extra time on my hands, so I found myself spending more and more time at the piano and uh, started to actually enjoy the music that I was learning. And this was still by ear when I first went blind. And the way I would learn it was I, I learned it a section at a time. You know, I'd go to my lesson, we'd spend about a half an hour, and I'd learn maybe a quarter of a piece. And I'd work on that and I'd have it memorized and go back the next week. So it would take you know, at least a month to learn a, a piece of music. And it was pretty slow, but it worked. Then in high school, or right before I got into high school, the, the Brailleist uh, in my area was also a violinist. So she was familiar with Braille music and uh, offered to come in once a week you know, during uh, my off hour in, in school and would teach me Braille music. And, uh, and, and so I learned all the basics and, and sort of became aware of it. And then in high school, actually, I really fell in love with jazz music. That was what became very central in my life. Uh, I was accepted to a magnet program for the arts in Norfolk. And that's where I started learning about jazz and sort of dove right in. And that was sort of what took up a lot of my time in high school. In college, I decided I wanted to study music. And um, so I, I, I majored in jazz performance. But as a jazz major, piano, classical, minor was, was also built into the curriculum. And uh, when I started getting the music for that, I thought, this might be a good time for me to uh, use the Braille music, because you get, you know, just uh, a semester isn't too long. So you have to learn that music in a semester and perform it at the end. So I thought, let me get into Braille music again. And so I ordered the Braille music dictionary, which is like <laughs> four volumes, I think. It's huge. And that was my go-to. I'd, I'd get you know, a Bach prelude and fugue and, and maybe a Chopin piece. And I'd go through it and have the dictionary on hand so that if there was a symbol I wasn't familiar with, I had a refresher. And it was a real eye-opener. Eye-opener. God, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> it was really wonderful to have this new access uh, because the way it would work is instead of learning a song over a month or two months, I'd get the songs that I was going to learn. I'd get in contact with John Hansen and let him know what I needed. And the music would show up in just maybe a couple days in my school mailbox up at uh, William Patterson University, where I was in New Jersey. And I'd just get to work. And it would take me a couple days. And I would have it memorized. And I'd be ready 
to go for the next lesson. And instead of spending all this time learning the music and learning the notes, uh, I could spend time with my teacher and, and actually learn how to play the music and how to interpret it and how to actually turn it into something personal. Uh, and it, it was really, really awesome. And I'm so glad that I, was ha I had the opportunity to, to get into it and so glad that they have this amazing service that's so quick and uh, has such a great selection. So that's where we are now. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Is there nuance in the, in the music that you didn't get learning by ear? Yeah, uh, when I learned by ear, um, uh, there would be times when I wouldn't get the right fingerings uh, for the piano. And when you're learning Chopin and you kind of, your hands are just going all over the place, not having the correct fingering and learning it the wrong way and practicing it the wrong way is really detrimental in being able to actually play the piece. Uh, so when I got into Braille music, that stuff was right there from the beginning. You know, I was able to read it, learn it, practice it slowly with the correct fingering, and that problem went away. Um, and of course, there's a lot of other little things that, that are in there that are very helpful. But for me, definitely, the fingering uh, being all there, right there when I needed it, right at the beginning, uh, was, was so helpful. So Justin, what was it that intrigued you about jazz? Mm. Um, so. You know, I had fallen in love with all this classical music, particularly Bach and Chopin and, and Ravel. Uh, when I got into the magnet program, I didn't know anything about jazz. And of course, they gave us a little entry exam. You know, do you know who Miles Davis is? I said, no. Do you know who John Coltrane is or Thelonious Monk? I said, Thelonious Monk, it's a crazy name. So I didn't, I didn't know anything really about jazz. And uh, it was from just square one. And it was such a freeing experience to, to dive in. You, you learn a structure. You learn all of the mechanics, the theory behind it, and the way that it works, because it's not just a free-for-all. You know, There's quite a lot of structure inside uh, a jazz performance. And you learn that, and then you, you, you start to learn the language, uh, how to improvise, and how to do it effectively, and how to actually tell a story and express yourself, and really getting into that was so liberating and, and uh, just so exciting for me to be able to realize I can express myself in such a personal way. And then uh, the other real revelation was that jazz music is very much, has been an oral tradition. Um, and that was great for me to participate with the other members of my class and we were sort of on equal footing. Um, learning by ear is, 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 is valued. Uh, sort of skill. So yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I love it. You have hobnobbed with some huge names in jazz. How'd you manage that? I mean, you, you just sort of, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Clark Terry. Just circum, I guess the circumstances. The, the way it worked is, is all very just organic, I think. Um, I went to school at William Patterson, like I mentioned, in, up in New Jersey. And met a lot of great, great teachers, a lot of great musicians, Harold Mayburn, uh, Mulgrew Miller, the late great Mulgrew Miller. Um, uh, and Clark Terry uh, lived um, about maybe 15 minutes from the campus. And he was considered sort of unofficial adjunct faculty in that whenever he would like to show up, he could. And uh, he could spend time with the students. And uh, while I was at school, I met a drummer named Al Hicks. And uh, we became good friends. And he was already close with Clark and was going to Clark's house all the time. And actually, how I met Clark was um, at this time, Clark was losing his sight because of diabetes. Uh, he must have been 87. And uh, he was having a tough time with it. So Al uh, thought it might be a good idea for me to swing by Clark's house and introduce myself and then share with him my experiences. I had been blind for, for quite some time now and was able to give him some encouragement. And, and that's how it really I got to know Clark. And it's, it's been probably a good eight years, eight or nine years that, I, that I've been spending time with Clark. And you mentioned Quincy Jones. Um, through my relationship with Clark, I was able to, to meet Quincy. Quincy was Clark's first student 
back in <laughs> 1957 or 58, maybe even before that. But Quincy was 12 or 13, and Clark was about 26, and he was touring with the Count Basie small group. And, and Quincy bugged him and bugged him and was able to start studying with him. And I was down at Clark's, this is two years ago now, um, like, like I, I usually do. He moved down to Arkansas, and I, I went down to visit him. I was spending time with him, and then Quincy showed up, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and I got to meet Quincy, and uh, just, just a remarkable uh, you know, sequence of events. It's been very cool. Wow. I will not take the rest of the floor and let other people ask questions if they have them. We have one question there. The question I have is, from your point of view as a young jazz musician, do you feel that, all, that, that jazz really is a dying art form? Because that's what some of the headlines will say, or, or, or do you feel otherwise? No, jazz is absolutely not a dying art form. Uh, it's, it's always been sort of an underground art form, I think ever since the 40s, uh, when it wasn't so much um, all about swing and dance bands, you know. Uh, really with, with bebop with Charlie Parker and these musicians, it became much more of a, a virtuosic art form and, 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 you know, they say a musician's music. And it did sort of go a little bit underground. Um, but it, all you have to do is, is I mean, you were here in D.C. and, and you, you watch the musicians that live here and perform in this area. It's definitely not dead. There's remarkable music being written, uh, being performed. Uh, it's, it's really the sad thing uh, about jazz, and I think also with classical music, is really the awareness. And um, there's just a, an unfortunate lack of education uh, and you know, awareness for kids and adults uh, for these really rich art forms. And that's something that, that Quincy is always uh, advocating. He says we, we really need to have more exposure and through exposure and through awareness, people can realize that this music is something that has a lot to offer and is a very fulfilling music to, to, to perform, but also to experience. But um, yeah, I, th I, think, I really think the problem is, is just being able to get it, out, get it out there. Yeah, no worries. Anyone else? In the back? Um, so, Justin, and I saw the movie over the weekend, too, and it was fabulous and uh, thank you. very inspiring, and you're a terrific player, so thank you very much. Um, in the movie, uh, you talked about having uh, stage fright, yeah. and I was wondering if you have learned how to manage that. I'm talking from, uh, as a musician who also had stage fright but learned to manage it. <laughs> have you learned how to manage it, or do you still have it? Or? I'm glad you say you learned how to manage it, because some people ask, uh, is it gone? Like, no, of course it's right. not gone. <laughs> it doesn't just vanish. Um, and, and it's sort of uh, stage fright nerves. Uh, for me, I think uh, a big part of it is the, the mental anxiety that goes on and sort of the mental, I become very self-critical when, when the nerves start going into override and I start thinking while I'm performing, I'll play a line and I'll think, oh, that was a terrible line. And then, of course, how are you going to make good music by, by beating yourself up during the performance? It, it doesn't work. So it's, it's really been a matter of learning more about just being in the moment. You know, things happen. You might, you might make a mistake or you might play something that you're not totally thrilled about. But for me, it's been, it's been a matter of just being able to embrace where I am in that moment. And, and um, you know, with the stage fright, uh, I've gotten a lot of great advice from, from Clark. Just saying, it's an energy, you know, that nervous energy. Where you just, you're like, why is my, why am I shaking? Why, am I? it's energy. And his thing is, you can either, you know, sort of fight that and, and inevitably lose, and, and sort of just kind of, you can destroy your performance, or you can channel that and think positively and actually say, I want to make this a better performance because of this energy that I have going on, and. Um, and that, that has helped me greatly, definitely. You know, just, <laughs> if, if you've seen the movie, it's, it's kind of, or if you haven't, it explores sort of my journey dealing with going to competitions and, and performing and dealing with that anxiety. And when I watch it, I'm just like, oh, would you just chill out? You know? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> that's, that's the best thing to do is just take a deep breath and relax. Hey, so Justin, um, on your website, it uh, says that uh, 
a CD was coming out uh, January 2014. Is that January 2015? 15. It should be 15. Okay, yeah, great. we'll have to edit that. But um, yeah. Uh, Looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's um, uh, recorded it uh, and uh, it's all ready to go and it's all originals and um, sort of inspired by, I wrote a song dedicated to Clark Terry, just simply called For Clark. And uh, that inspired me to sort of see what else music I could write, you know, for, for specific people. And I wrote a dedication to Mulgrew, who I got to spend time with. And um, it's, it's basically a, a collection of, of dedications, and it's just simply entitled Dedication. So I'm looking forward to sharing that in January. Okay. And is there another question? <laughs> Mr. Jackson. Given the um, um, ease with which people today can make CDs and even get access to public performances. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts that you could share with, with young musicians to help them sort of distinguish themselves uh, to get above the fray, because it's so easy uh, to, to, get, to get access to the internet. But so my question really is, what are the tools that people need to, to sort of be successful in this day when it's so easy to, to get access to public performances? Well, I mean, first off, uh, before even thinking about that stuff, you know, you say to, to get above the fray and, and to deal with all these things. Um, for me, it's been, well, let's figure out what it is that we want to say first, you know. Uh, really, really spend time thinking about that stuff, not, not actually thinking about, well, how am I going to impress or how am I going to do, how am I going to, really for me, it's been how am I going to be honest with myself and put out music and write music or perform music that that means something to me first, and and then I'll think about sharing it, because then then I'm actually getting it to an actual genuine thing coming from me. And th there, like you said, there's a lot of great tools out there. There's a lot of ways to share your music. And to be to be honest, I would say jump in. Um, it, there is a lot of access to being able to record your own music, and and that's that's really great. Um, but the thing is, just because that access is there doesn't mean people really know how to use it. So there's a lot of stuff out there that's, if you create good quality material, and if you take the time to actually learn and, and put out, th that will help it stand out. Because you, 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 you go on YouTube or any of these things, and it's a thing recorded on an iPhone. And you know, I, I really think that, that if you take the time to, to, to come with something come up with something with good, you know, quality, that, that uh, uh, definitely helps it. But, but to be honest, it's, uh, I would encourage really just to, to really define your thing, you know, your, and it doesn't have to be anything profound, but it's just something that means something to you. And then, then you can jump in to YouTube or SoundCloud or, or whatever. <laughs> I, I'm always so gratified to see young people continuing American, uh, American classical music, mm. i.e. jazz. Um, and uh, it's just very heartening. And uh, I'm intrigued by what you just said about writing your own stuff. So I'm wondering, OK, you probably write by ear, but then does it get transcribed by you or someone else into Braille and then Will you be closing the loop? Will it come back here to the library? Oh, gosh. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Um, well, uh, the process has been, um, like you say, I usually sit at the piano, and that's where the ideas come. And uh, I usually have some kind of recorder handy to, to, to make sure I capture that, that idea as I'm playing it or whatever. Then that gets developed, and I sit and, and usually work it out on the piano or at the computer. And I have um, assistive technology that allows me to, uh, first of all, get, get speech output from the computer. And then uh, it, it, I use um, a notation software called Sibelius. And there were scripts developed for Sibelius to allow me to actually type in notes uh, and, and, and sort of create very simple scores, you know, basically the melody and maybe the bass line and the chords on top, you know, for, for any musicians that I want to play the music. Uh, 
you, you know, it's, it, I'm glad you mentioned the Braille thing because there, there's another uh, software called Lime and uh, Lime Allowed, uh, developed by Dancing Dots, which is a great company that provides a lot of uh, assistive technology or scripts that make doing something like that possible. And uh, I think once I have a, a body of work, I, w I would, wouldn't mind, um, you know, jumping down that, going down that path, I guess, and, and having, it, having it done in Braille. Uh, and if anybody actually wants it, I guess they could have access to it. It would be great. I can add that there are many who actually would uh, be interested <laughs> in precisely that. Oh, that's good. And uh, I see a hand right there in the back. Um, I was wondering, do you feel like you have enough access to, to the Braille music that you, that you need? With the NLS, with the National Library Service? Absolutely. I haven't, I haven't actually come across a piece that I needed that I couldn't get uh, from the service. And it's been, uh, you know, I've, I would just send them whatever it is that my teacher gave me without even thinking, is this, a, is this available? And I'd send it and it'd be there in two days. <laughs> I, that's the thing that would blow my mind. It's always so fast. <laughs> I get it. I get it faster than if I actually was using print and had to find the find the print music. So there was. It's always been remarkable. Yeah. Yes. There's a back behind you. <laughs> um, do you um, work with young people, and if so, how? Yes. Uh, I do teach privately piano. Um, right now, I don't. Mm, I don't work with beginner students. I usually work with students that have had some training in classical music or are familiar with the piano. And uh, what I work in with is sort of beginning improvisation, sort of beginning jazz theory, uh, you know, up to an intermediate and advanced. And I have a few students, and uh, that's one thing that I actually gained uh, a greater perspective on after spending time with Clark Terry, who's, who's a wonderful educator. And I realized, yeesh, I need to. I need to get involved with this as well. You know, I'd be very selfish if I kept this to myself. So I, that's kind of uh, how, I, how I'm approaching it now. And then obviously I'm very open to whatever avenues might open because definitely teaching, and I mentioned awareness is a big problem for jazz and for classical music. And uh, I hope that me getting involved can help in uh, you know, just a small way. I'm just curious to know how you found William Patterson College or University? University, yeah. yeah. Um, so at the magnet school that I was going to down in Virginia, Governor's School for the Performing Arts, uh, one of the teachers there, his name is Jeff Smith, is a saxophonist, um, during my sophomore and junior year, uh, went to get his master's at William Patterson. And uh, that was one thing that happened. And then he came back during my senior year while I was looking at colleges. And I said, well, what about William Patterson? He goes, I think it'd be great. And then, um, while I was in high school, I began performing with a fellow named Jay Sennett, who's down in, 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 our, in the Virginia Beach area, who's a drummer. And I started playing in his trio, and I would fill in for his pianist, who also went to William Patterson for his master's in arranging. And both these guys are just incredible musicians, so I thought, well, I should definitely check it out. And so I went to check out Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music and the new school in New York. And then sort of on my way home, I stopped by William Patterson. And really the thing that... I think was the clincher was I, I went during a thing called Dialogue Day where they have all of the school, all of the ensembles perform for each other and they give, they critique each other. And it's a cool way, you know, to, to check out the program and see the caliber of the musicians. And James Williams, who also, um, you know, he passed away actually uh, a few years back, was the director of the program and he was running it. And Harold Mayburn, another amazing piano player, was in the audience. And I just fell in love with those two guys immediately. Just the, the way they commanded the room, the stories they were telling, it just, I thought, this is where I want to be, for sure. And uh, that's really how, how I ended up there. Is there another uh, question? All right. Hi, this is a more general question. Um, I too am intrigued by the fact that you're such a young person and you have such a passion for jazz. I mean, how did you first get the bug? Um, just how did you know that this was the thing for you? I, I mean, I see fewer and fewer young people um, have a passion for either classical or jazz music. Um, 
When did you know you were, um, this was your mission? Um, I, really, it was when I started learning it. Uh, I think it was at a time where I was trying to think, well, what am I going to do when I grow up? What am I going to do professionally? Uh, classical music was something that I enjoyed very much, but the reason I got put in the jazz department was, was because the, the director of the program thought, you know, the sight reading requirements will be a little difficult uh, because I can learn music quickly, but I can't learn it that quick. We know where a, a vocalist might need an accompanist, and the pianist needs to read that on the spot. You know, you can't know all of that music. And they thought, let's put him in the jazz department. And when I, when I started to realize all of the things that I could do in jazz, you know, as a blind person, really, and then obviously fell in love with the music and, and, the, and the musicians. But it was sort of just like, wow. And, and when I was 14, I started to work. I played uh, with other, other students at the school. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm working. <laughs> it was like... It, it probably wasn't so, you know, romantic where I was like, oh my God, jazz music, this is it. You know, it was kind of like, I got a job. Like, this is great. <laughs> I'm thrilled. I'm making money and I'm getting tips and stuff. So it was, I mean, that, that's just how it happened. But it became something, obviously the passion is there and it, and it developed the more I got deeper into it. But that was sort of how it began. Yes. Hi, my name is Charles Marston. How you doing, Justin? I think we communicated before through a Dancing Dots list. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, I'm sorry if you talked about this before I got here a little late, but uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, regarding your s upcoming CD, did you produce the art yourself? Um, I know you've probably been using uh, K-Talking or other products uh, with Sonar, so I wanted to know, if you produce your own CD, you did the recordings. How was that experience? Well, uh, I did. I, I I did produce it, but with with the help um, with Quincy Jones, uh, who is the the main producer on the project. And uh, sort of the the way it came about actually is I did use sonar and cake talking, um, in the initial stages when I was writing the music. Um, I had I I had just previously explained I I used uh, Sibelius and scripts that are available with Sibelius to, to write the music. But what I did is I used sonar and, and just instruments, uh, you know, soft synth synthesizer instruments, you know, the bass and the piano and the drums and the guitar. And I would play all the parts in so that I had an audio file to send to all the other musicians in the band so that they could hear sort of what I was looking for uh, in, in conjunction with sending them the, uh, the print music. And uh, that was a great thing to be able to give to them so I could really not have to explain so much. Here's kind of my idea. Here's the drums, how I sort of want them to sound. And then the process of recording, obviously, we got together. We were in L.A. And um, since I had all that stuff in place, it wasn't too hard to, we didn't have to do much rehearsing. And uh, we were able to dive in. And, and um, it was a lot of fun, <laughs> definitely a lot of fun. Hi, Justin. Given that jazz is an oral tradition, what role do you see for libraries and other institutions in, in helping to perpetuate and preserve it? Well, it, it is an oral tradition, but it's because of sort of the institutionalization of the music in the last probably 30 years, where we have it in schools and there is a curriculum. And um, that's, that's actually a really good question. I mean, I've never approached the library. I'm sure they have, uh, you know, lead sheets and things like that available. And probably you could help yes, answer yes, that. Yes, we do. Yeah. If you want one, we uh, <laughs> have many. And th that obviously helps. Uh, one thing that, that I'm always thrilled about when I, when I see uh, certain different archives, that's, that's usually Clark Terry at, at William Patterson University they have, you know, um, different archives for these musicians and sort of their bodies of work. And uh, one thing, and this, this is sort of just like very personal, what I, what I think would be awesome for me is there are things called transcription books. You know, like if you want to study Charlie Parker, you can buy a Charlie Parker transcription book. And that would be something that I would be like uh, amazed to see, you know, transcribed in Braille. That would be something that would be 
very exciting. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to bring it to John. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll have to throw this idea at him because, uh, you know, that would be something uh, very exciting for me, at least personally. <laughs> I think you'll get one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes. It's Valerie. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know who some of your favorite jazz musicians are and if you have a particular affinity in any way for uh, other, other musicians that are blind, like George Shearing or Henry Butler or anybody like that. Yeah, well, probably the top of my list is Art Tatum, who was also um, okay. just about totally blind. Uh, there's some really funny stories about him. Actually, Quincy tells me a story about it. getting in the car in New York when he was a kid. Uh, I guess he had just moved him to New York, and, and Art Tatum was in the front seat. And he goes, what the? You know, what's this guy doing? Get out of the car. What are you, you better not be driving, you know. Art Tatum, I think you could only see, like, just a little bit out of his right eye. Um, but there's, man, uh, the, my first love was Bill Evans. And then um, I remember hearing Keith Jarrett and falling in love. And then it was Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock and McCoy Tyner. Uh, and uh, obviously the list kind of it just continues. It goes on and on and on. There's so many great musicians. Uh, George Shearing is definitely a great, great. I just picked up George Shearing playing with Nat King Cole, uh, which also another a wonderful pianist. Um, but my top three right now and have been for a while, I, it doesn't matter really what mood I'm in, I can listen to them. And it's Art Tatum, Oscar Peterson, and uh, Mulgrew Miller. And their technique is, is, is wonderful, but their touch um, just, just knocks me out. Similar, Hank Jones is another one. Just, I can't believe what the kind of sound that they get out of that instrument. It blows my mind, and I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking, man, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you make the piano sound like that? And do I need to gain 200 pounds to do it? Because... <laughs> uh, I'll try. <laughs> we're here from the West Coast. We were in New York visiting our son and saw the movie and really enjoyed it. And oh, wow. We're now here at the uh, um, Family Physician Convention. I'm a family physician. and I have to ask, how is Clark doing? Because we were it, watching him through the movie and his health problems was concerning. Yeah. And Clark is doing very well. Uh, he'll be turning 94 in December. And... Um, I just visited him about a month and a half ago, and uh, in great spirits. I think I talked to him a few days ago, and uh, he, I mean, he is almost 94, so he's you know a li little bit frail, um, but just uh, such a such a vibrant spirit that it's uh, he, he's yeah he's still he's still doing really well. He's still teaching quite a bit, and. Um, yeah, yeah, he's still he's still spending time with students. I have a whole list of things that I'm going to do next time I get down there, uh, and it, it's it's just it's such a blessing to have somebody like that around, and so so thankful that I've been able to spend just any time with him, and uh, yeah, so he's he's doing really well for sure. Hi, Justin. I want to know what role do you feel the music has played for you and can play for other young people in terms of teaching them about how these great artists, these jazz masters, have um, been part of evolving cultural history and the American framework of what it means to be American, so that it would not be something just for music students, but for young people who may just love music or love story and the idea of oral traditions to learn about their lives and why the music means so much to, say, music majors, but could also mean a lot to them as just listeners and appreciators. Well, I think music, just in general, is is uh, such an important thing for any culture, uh, and for us, you know, jazz music and, and folk music as well, and uh, the things that have come from our culture are really important because it is a part of who we are in this culture. You know, it's it, it's it's really a part of us, and. Um, it, it, it's something that, it, it, you know, you should learn about yourself, right? So that should be something that we all should be aware of. And it's definitely something that's not restricted to just a musician who's learning about this. 
the the experiences that these musicians have, um, you know, speak to so many experiences that we that have that we've had, all, you know, with jazz over the last century, over a century, and uh, where that music comes from is is such such an important part of our history, you know, with, uh, I mean, looking at the sort of music that came out during the 60s, that's such a direct reflection of the experiences that a lot of uh, African Americans were having, and, and to be able to connect with that through the music, not just by reading about it, but actually connecting it through the emotion that these guys are expressing, you really can't get any deeper than that and, and be more connected with what might have been going on. and. Um, so yeah, uh, I think if you, if you want to know more about our culture or, or about where we come from as a nation, it's, it, it should be a part of that. It should be something that we, we learn about. Good evening, Justin. Hi. I have two questions. The first question is, how did the movie come to be made? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> The movie, uh, so I, I mentioned that I met a drummer named Al Hicks, and he's who introduced me to Clark Terry. And we both played in Clark's small ensemble uh, while we were at school together. And we all became quite close and spent a lot of time together. And uh, Clark and Gwen Terry, his wife, took really good care of us. Then when we graduated, Al went back to Australia, where he's, where he's from. And I moved to New York. And Al was actually approached by um, a documentary company from Australia because they were intrigued by his relationship with Clark. You know, this Australian drummer and this legendary jazz musician. Like, this is an unlikely relationship. And uh, they approached him, and unfortunately, funding kind of didn't come through, so it didn't happen. And he was surfing with a buddy of his who happens to be a good uh, photographer. And he's saying, I think it's a real bummer that we weren't able to document Clark, you know, get something on this guy, because there's nothing. And somebody should do it. You know, he's a beautiful person. We've, we've gotten so much wonderful lessons and stories. And it, 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 it's a real shame that not more people are getting access to that. So they just basically said, well, let's just do it ourselves. And it's really like a big decision to make when neither of them have any film experience. You know, Al's a drummer. and. <laughs> Adam, the photographer, surfs, you know, or they both surf. So, uh, but I think it's the like they have it's this Australian attitude, like ah, let's go for it, let's just do it, and that's what they did. They saved up their money, bought a camera, sort of started studying maybe like how to make a film, and uh, <laughs> that's uh, they 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 and they um they they bought a ticket, moved, came back to the United States and started filming Clark. And they, first it was going to be sort of a biopic on Clark Terry, on his life. And uh, the more time they spent with him and the more time they started interviewing uh, his students, you know, uh, really great musicians that are on the scene and, and, and very successful, they would all say, he's, he's definitely one of the greatest trumpeters and flugelhornists, but also he's one of the greatest teachers. And Al was like, oh, yeah, of course, I know this. You know, I've spent the last eight years getting to know him and spending time and learning from him. And uh, I'd sort of be at Clark's place all the time down in Arkansas. So they were like, well, Justin, you mind if we follow you with the camera and recorder? And uh, I, didn't, I really didn't think anybody would see it. That was really what I thought. So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> let's, let's go for it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, and they did for four years. And they were just there. And he, he says, because he didn't you know, have any film background or anything, his approach to it was, let's just keep filming. And they <laughs> would film all the time. And they lived, it was just him and his buddy. And you know, they had another um, photographer, uh, videographer that would come in when they needed him. Small, just, just a two or three man crew. And they would live, we would live at Clark's place for, for a few weeks at a time. Or they would live at my place, you know, for a few weeks at a time, and they just would do that. They'd, 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 they'd film for about three months, run out of money, uh, go find jobs. Al would go play drums somewhere, and Adam would go back to Australia and work, and they'd save up money for about three months, and then get back on it, and they'd start filming. And quite a quite a process. Uh, it's it's unbelievable that it got made. <laughs> uh, it, it, we just keep on pinching ourselves. The fact that it's here, it's actually 
in theaters, people are able to see it and witness, and, and we're able to share Clark, which was the main goal, you know, to share Clark and let people get to know a, an amazing musician, but also, more importantly, an amazing person. My second question yes. is, now that you are a star oh, God. <laughs> in a film, you are, have, you are a somewhat accomplished musician. How does this fit into your career plan? You know, um, students are always told you to have a five-year plan. <laughs> so how, do you, how does this fit? Where do you see yourself in five years? I think it fits pretty good. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's, I, my career plan for a while has been, I hope to be able to share my music. Uh, if it's with five people or 500, uh, I, I'm happy if I'm able to do this and actually continue doing it. And uh, the, the events of the last few years have been quite remarkable and, and, and quite unexpected, uh, but I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm really, I really am thrilled. I, I, as a musician, I just hope to be able to share uh, my music and hopefully, uh, you know, I definitely, I hope to bring positivity and, and hopefully brighten people's days or whatever. And uh, whatever platform I get, I'll, I'll be thrilled to have. And uh, we're just going to keep on. Oof. The movie's <laughs> called, <laughs> it's called Keep On Keeping On. Yeah. Hey, hey, thank you, Justin. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, coming. And I. Uh, Hope you, like I, am looking forward to the uh, next hour. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.